Such a society could never function using a money system utterly dependent on perpetually accelerating growth. A stable economy would need a money supply at least capable of remaining stable without collapsing. Let's say the total volume of this stable money supply is represented by this big circle. Let's also imagine that money lenders must actually have existing money to lend. If some people within this money supply begin systematically lending money at interest, their share of the money supply will grow. If they continually reloan at interest all the money that gets paid back, what's the inevitable result? Whether it's gold, fiat, or debt money doesn't matter. The money lenders will end up with all the money. And after the foreclosures and bankruptcies are all filed, they'll get all the real property too. Only if the proceeds of lending at interest were evenly distributed among the population would this central problem be solved. Heavy taxation of bank profits might accomplish this goal. But then why would banks want to be in business? If we were ever able to free ourselves of the current situation, we could imagine banking run as a non-profit service to society, dispersing its interest earnings as a universal citizen dividend, or lending without charging interest at all. If it is the fundamental nature of the system that causes the problems, tinkering with the system cannot ever solve those problems. The system itself must be replaced. Many monetary critics call for a return to gold-based money, claiming that gold has a long history of reliability. They ignore the many scams that can be played with gold, shaving coins, debasing the metal, cornering the market, all of which were abundantly practiced in ancient Rome and contributed to its fall. Some advocate silver at being more abundant than gold and therefore more difficult to corner. Many question the need to bring back precious metals at all. No one wants to go back to carrying heavy sacks of coins to go shopping. It's a certainty that paper, digital, plastic, or more likely biometric ID money would be the real medium of trade with the same potential for creating unlimited debt money we have now. Beyond that, if gold again became the sole legal basis of money, those who have no gold would suddenly have no money. Other monetary reform advocates have concluded that greed and dishonesty are the main problems, and that there may be better ways to create an honest and equitable money system than returning to silver or gold. Inventive minds have proposed a variety of alternate ways to create money. Many private barter systems create money as debt, much as banks do, but it is done openly and without charging interest. An example is a barter system in which debt is expressed as pledges of hours of work, all work being valued equally at a dollar figure that then allows hours to be equated with the dollar price of goods. This kind of money system can be set up by anyone who can devise a way to do the accounting and find willing and trustworthy participants. Setting up a local barter money system, even if it were little used now, would be prudent emergency planning for any community. Monetary reform, like electoral reform, is a big topic and one that requires a willingness to change and to think outside the box. Monetary reform, again, like electoral reform, will not come easily because the enormously powerful interests that benefit from the existing system will do their utmost to maintain their advantage. Now that we've seen that money is just an idea and that in reality money can be whatever we make it, here's one very simple alternative monetary concept to consider. This model is based on systems that have worked in the past in England and America, systems that were undermined and destroyed by the goldsmith bankers and their fractional reserve system.
To create an economy based on permanent interest-free money, money could simply be created and spent into the economy by the government, preferably on long-lasting infrastructure that facilitates the economy, such as roads, railroads, bridges, harbors, and public markets. This money would not be created as debt, it would be created as value, that value being in the form of whatever it was spent on. If this new money facilitated a proportional increase in trade requiring its use, it would cause no inflation whatsoever. If government spending did cause inflation, there would be two courses of action available. Inflation is equivalent in effect to a flat tax on money. Whether the money goes down in value 20% or the government takes 20% of our money away from us, the effect on our buying power is the same. Viewed this way, inflation in place of taxation might be politically acceptable if well spent and kept within limits. Or government could choose to counter inflation by collecting tax monies that it then takes out of use, thus reducing the money supply and restoring its value. To control deflation, which is the phenomenon of falling wages and prices, the government would simply spend more money into existence. With no competing private debt money creation, governments would have more effective control of their nation's money supply. The public would know whom to blame if things went wrong. Governments would rise and fall on their ability to preserve the value of money. Government would operate primarily on taxes as it does now, but tax money would go much, much further as none of it would be required to pay interest to private bankers. There could be no national debt if the federal government simply created the money it needed. Our perpetual collective servitude to the banks through interest payments on government debt would be impossible. What we have been taught to believe is democracy and freedom has become in reality an ingenious and invisible form of economic dictatorship. As long as our entire society remains utterly dependent on bank credit for its supply of money, bankers will be in the position to make the decisions on who gets the money they need and who doesn't.